Welcome to the Science and Society series. In this series, I plan to have seven sessions to discuss the nature of science, how to acquire it, and how it impacts the society. So in this first session, we are going to discuss what science is. We all agree that science is part of our common knowledge, but it has some special characteristic that sets it apart from the rest of our knowledge. So what are these characteristics? Let us start with a very simple example to illustrate this point. Let's assume someone like myself who is not a medical doctor and I got a cold. And it is part of my common knowledge that when I, someone has a cold, we should avoid some particular types of food. Is that science? I would say no. Why? For several reasons. Number one, because I'm not a medical doctor, I don't know what are the active ingredients in the food that would affect my cold, whether to make it worse or to keep it, or to get it better, or no effect at all. And number two, that claim is not verified in my mind, in the sense that I didn't try to challenge it and see if I really eat these particular types of food, would my cold get worse, really? Or no, particular, no observable difference? And number three, I just know this piece of data through a limited number of people. Maybe I just have heard it from my parents. That's all. Now, if we move this exact example to a medical doctor, we'd see a different picture. Number one, because he is a medical doctor and because he studied biochemistry and physiology, he would know how some types of food would affect the cold. So that's what you would get in a scientific material. You will get an established relationship between the cause and the effect. And number two, again, because he is a doctor, he would have access to periodical journals that publish some data, and they would really do a study over enough number of people to verify that claim. So this one is particularly important that you would get verified claims. And as I said before, these claims will be supported by sufficient amount of supportive data. So if we look at these factors all together in a holistic view, you will see that these factors form our perception about science. That's what makes us feel what science is. And we seem to have reached an important point here. These factors taken together constitute what we call it the scientific method. This scientific method actually distinguishes between science and the common knowledge. Whenever it is satisfied, we get science. When it is not fulfilled, we don't get science. It is just a common knowledge. It may be verified, it may be unverified. So now let us take a closer look at some particular disciplines to see whether they really follow this scientific method or not. Let us start with physics. And I will comment later on my choice of starting with physics. If we look at the physical laws, of course, all the physical laws fit within mathematical framework. So they are quantitative by definition. They give us quantitative figures very accurately and very precise. So the physical laws are quantitative. Number two, they are also universal in the sense that they apply anywhere. So take, for example, Newton's law of the gravitational force. It applies on the planetary motion, it applies on projectiles, it applies on the tidal force. All these phenomena are described by the same law. So this law is universal, like the rest of the physical laws. And number three, in most of, experiment, of, uh, of the experiment of physics, they are amenable to experimental validation, meaning that we can experiment and figure out whether the law is really applied or fulfilled or not. So these three factors together are in nice agreement with the scientific method. The physical laws are quantitative, universal, and amenable to experimental validation. Now let's move to chemistry and see. 
yes, chemistry is another good example of following the scientific method. Chemistry is also quantitative by the fact that the periodic table is arranged based on the atomic number of the elements. Also, the reaction themselves show us the relative proportions between the substances involved in the reaction. So, for example, we need two molecules of hydrogens and one molecule of oxygen to form one molecule of HTO, which is water. So they are very quantitative, actually quantitative on the level of the molecules, the number of molecules. And of course, all the chemicals formulas are universal and by definition they are also very experimental. So chemistry is again another nice discipline where the scientific uh, method is nicely applied. But when we move to something like biology, we'll feel some differences. Why? Because in biology, mathematics is less visible and less used. So, for example, when you classify the animals, which is a branch of biology, you will see that that classification is descriptive. No math is used. So, here we notice some difference between biology on one hand and physics and chemistry on the other hand. In biology, mathematics is less used. So, now let's make a bigger jump. Let's move to the social sciences. Now you will see not one difference. You will see so many differences between the social sciences on one hand and the natural sciences like physics, chemistry, and biology on the other hand. Social sciences actually deal with very complex phenomena. And these complex phenomena usually involve very large numbers of variables, very large number of variables. Because of that, the social sciences are statistical in nature. They don't apply to every case. And their laws or their formulas do not involve very accurate quantitative figures, like natural sciences, as we just talked. That's what made actually some philosophers of science even question, do social, do social sciences have laws at the first place? I would say yes. Why? Because a science, a social science, like economics, for example, economics study how natural resources are distributed. It studies the uh, production cycle. Uh, it studies why the living standards in some countries are very high but low in others. It also studies the financial market and they try to understand how it works and they try to predict its behavior. Of course, these are all very important phenomena that affect our life. And the, uh, eco economists study this phenomena through objective analysis of, the, of these phenomena. And they try to figure out the triggers and the outcomes. And they try to formulate it in some laws. So in this sense, I would say that social sciences are formal sciences that enjoy all the merits like the ones natural sciences have. So here we are summarizing what we said, that social, science, uh, social uh, sciences and social laws are statistical in nature. They don't usually provide quantitative answers. Sometimes or many times they provide qualitative answers. Even the typical example people usually give which is the law of demand and supply, doesn't give quantitative answers. In the sense that if I know exactly the demand and the supply in number, I wouldn't expect how higher or how lower the price will go. And also in many cases, social laws do not offer high degree of experimental validation. Of course, this is a general statement because not all the social laws are on the same level. So, for example, with uh, psychology, it is not too bad, especially when you try to measure the cognitive abilities of people. It is not too bad. You have a nice set of experiments that can uh, figure out how high these cognitive abilities are. But when it comes to things like sociology, like the economy, which, are, which represent condition of the society, we can't really change that. We can't play with it. 
So this is a big challenge in the social sciences. You cannot isolate the variables the way you do with physics. In physics, we are very accustomed to this fact that we can keep all the variables constant except one. We cannot really do that with sociology or with uh, economics. Why? Because these variables are out of control. They don't represent something we can really play with. So it seems that now we reached some conclusion that natural sciences give quantitative numbers, but social sciences don't really give that quantitative figures, and also they are not very amenable to experimental validation. However, we have to note that what we consider from natural sciences only three, physics, chemistry, and biology. So that poses these questions you see here. Do all natural sciences provide quantitative figures? Do all of them allow experimental validation? So now let's expand our focus and consider more natural sciences and see if we'll keep the same perception or not. Actually, if we look at, at geology, we'll see a different picture. Geology is also descriptive science because we don't have a direct access to what happens in the core of the Earth. The maximum we can do is to analyze some layers of the Earth and see their composition. So, as a result, we have very limited degree of experimentation. Similar to what we used to talk about natural sciences. And also meteorology. Meteorology is also the same. They also analyze very complex phenomena, and these phenomena include so many variables, and as a result, we don't really have much room for experimentation. That's why the weather forecasting are not always correct. Some of them turn out to be wrong. So, as we can see here, we started to hear some stuff about complex phenomena and about many variables involved and about limited degree of experimentation in, social sci in some natural sciences, very similar to what we used to talk about in social sciences. So that leads us to realize that the scientific method actually varies a lot from one discipline to another. And there is no one recipe you can apply to all of them. The what I would say, what qualifies some discipline as a science is the objective analysis, the analysis that lead us to figure out what is the cause and what are the effects, and to understand the dynamics and to try to use that for our own advantage, whether in doing useful or taking useful measurements or designing some useful devices, etc. That's what I would call science. And that applies to natural sciences the same way it applies to social sciences. And that's why we shouldn't, I shouldn't actually have started with physics. Because it's such a science that give you, that mislead you. It gives you the impression that all natural sciences are actually subject to experimental validation, which is not the case. Actually, even some philosophers of science themselves, they talk about experimental validation uh, as if it is given for grant in all natural sciences. And after you analyze what they say, it turns out that they are talking about physics. They are not talking about all natural sciences, actually. So since we talked about science, let us give a couple of examples about pseudoscience, fake science. Astrology actually is one of them, because astrology is based on the assumption that the locations of the planet affect our lives, which is a logical assumption, and there is no proof for it. Another example of pseudoscience is evolution. For me, evolution is an ideology, it's not science, and it is based on unproven conjectures, so it wouldn't qualify as science. People also compare between science and art. What are the differences between science and art? We'll just mention two, two of them briefly. Number one, science describes the reality. The more accurate you describe the reality, the better that science is. 
But actually art deviates from the reality. Art is an expression of the inner feeling of the artist. So this is one big difference. Another difference is when you do science, whatever you design or whatever you reach, it should serve a particular function. But actually for art, art is not mainly concerned about doing something for your life. Actually mainly, art is about stimulating the sense of beauty. So these are two big differences between science and art. However, there is no logical contradiction about combining them. Sometimes science and art are combined. And an example for that is image processing. Many of the techniques of image processing are heuristic. And people say image processing is an art, not really science. But of course, it is based on many mathematical uh, derivation and the quantitative number is definitely there. So the science part is there. So I would look at image processing as a nice combination of science and art. And maybe there are other examples too. So we end this session by asking a question. We qualified a discipline as science based on the fact it studies a phenomena, a phenomena and it analyzes it in an objective way. But what about a discipline like accounting? Accounting actually doesn't study any phenomena. Actually, accounting, according to my understanding, is a way for recording the financial data. And based on this nice recording of the data, we can come up with some useful indicator about the financial market or whatever financial uh, activity we are dealing with. So would you qualify accounting as a science? And if you think yes, tell us why, based on which criteria. So please, you can put your input in the comment. And I hope that you will continue with me uh, in the next session, so please stay with us. Thank you.